The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in the first chapter, reading verses 26 and 33. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. We still are looking at this teaching, this great doctrine concerning the baptism with the Holy Ghost. We are doing this, let me say once more, because of our conviction that this is in many ways the most urgent matter that should be on the minds of all Christian people at this present hour. I mean by that, that if we are at all concerned about the state of the church and the state of the country, well then this is of paramount importance. I sometimes think that to those of us who live in London are tempted to have a false picture of the true state of the Christian cause in this country. In a great metropolis like this, uh, you tend to see things in many ways at their best as well as at their worst. And we tend to have a false picture. A great city like London tends to give a false picture of life in every respect. And we must ever bear that in mind. But if you are to see the state of the, the Christian cause in this land, well then, you must look at it as it is to be found in little chapels and churches up and down the country, not only in villages and hamlets, but in the smaller towns and so on. And the moment you see that, you realize that the position is indeed desperate. And to me, there is only one thing to say in the light of all this. There is nothing that is going to meet this situation except a mighty revival of religion, a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. The Church has tried everything else. She has never been so highly organized. She's never been so busy. She produces literature. She organizes campaigns. She goes in for publicity methods. Everything that can be done has been done. But the position goes from bad to worse. And looking across the history of the Church, it's surely plain and evident that God's way throughout the centuries has been to pour forth his spirit from on high. The church has been kept alive by a series of great revivals. And a revival means that the spirit of God is poured out upon the church as, she was, as, it, as it was he was on the day of Pentecost. Now that is a plain fact of history. In other words, history confirms what I have been suggesting for many weeks now is the plain teaching of the New Testament itself. And yet what we are confronted with is a strange, not only reluctance of people, Christian people, uh, to believe this, but even an opposition to it. That's the thing that I find so difficult to understand. And that is why it is so essential that we should be dealing with this matter in detail. And that is why we should also try to deal with difficulties, which people quite honestly and sincerely find in their minds. And that is the point at which we have arrived in our consideration of this matter at the moment. Now, the last time uh, we looked at this on April the 11th, I dealt with a problem that has often been put to me and has often presented itself to people's minds, uh, namely as to whether the scriptures don't teach in certain places that all Christians of necessity have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, we dealt with texts like Luke 11:13 and Acts 2:39. The promise is to you and to your children and to as many as are afar off. Ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Therefore they say, it is for all and 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, we dealt with those last time, and I think we were able to show that when those texts are considered truly, they do not teach 
that all are baptized with the Holy Ghost at the time of regeneration. You remember the argument that people bring forward with regard to 1 Corinthians 12:13, uh, where the apostle says that ye have been all baptized by one spirit into one body. All, they say. But we were able to show that that doesn't deal with the baptism with the spirit at all but deals with the action of the Spirit in baptizing us into the body of Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who baptizes us with the Spirit. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says that it is the Spirit who baptizes, and he baptizes us into the body of Christ. That is true, of course, of every Christian. You can't be a Christian without having the Spirit in you. You cannot be a Christian without being baptized into the body of Christ. Of course, it's true of every single Christian. But we are considering the baptism with the Spirit. And we have seen the abundant evidence which shows us that it is possible to be a Christian without that. Very well. Now, there are some other difficulties that I would like to deal with. And let me say again, I'm doing this for one reason only. To me, this is the most urgent question of the hour. The need of this power for witness the need of this power in our lives. The early church turned the world upside down as the result of this baptism. And without it, we shall avail nothing. So it is important for the church as a whole and for the individual Christian. Now, the next question, therefore, that people often put is this. All right, they say, I'll accept what you've said to the effect that every Christian is not automatically and of necessity baptized with the Holy Ghost. But, do not the New Testament scriptures suggest that at any rate all the early Christians were baptized with the Holy Ghost? All the members of the early infant Christian church. Now, they then adduce certain texts which seem to teach that, or at any rate which almost seem to assume that. Here are the three main ones. Let me read them to you. Romans 5.5, 5, where Paul says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's, it should be read, The Holy Ghost has been shed abroad in our hearts, or the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. He seems there, they say, to be saying that this is true of every single member of the church in Rome. Then you remember the apostle in uh, Ephesians 1.13 writes these words, in whom you also trusted. He means by you the Gentiles. He's been saying what's happened to the Jews. Now he says, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Isn't he saying there that this was true of every single member of the church at Ephesus and the other churches to which this letter was sent? And then take finally 1 Peter 1.8. Peter, writing to the strangers scattered abroad throughout Pontus, Galatia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, Asia, and so on. And this is what he says. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, as I've often pointed out, he wasn't writing that to apostles. He was writing that to these people whom he didn't even know. Strangers scattered abroad. Christian people in different countries, in different parts of the world. And that is what he says about them. That they are rejoicing in this Lord whom they've never seen with their naked eyes, with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. He seems to be saying that about all of them. Well, now, what, what do we make of all this? Well, it is, I admit, a difficult question. And I suggest to you that the answer is this. The apostles in writing these letters, obviously, have to assume a kind of norm, a kind of standard, a kind of pattern. 
they always write in terms of the church as she should be. And therefore these descriptions which they give of the early Christians are descriptions of the church as she is meant to be in the purpose of God. There is no question about that at all. We have depicted in the New Testament the ideal Christian church. And that, of course, is where these epistles are of such value to us. We should always be examining ourselves in the light of this and testing ourselves and asking ourselves certain questions. Are we like that? Take, for instance, what I've just quoted, the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verse 8. Do you and I, my friends, rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Do we? That's the question. Now then, there I say is the norm and the pattern for the Christian church. That's one answer, therefore, that the apostles are writing with that uh, supposition, with that assumption. Here is the description of the true church. But secondly, and I think perhaps this second point is even more helpful, at least I find it so myself. Our danger, as I've pointed out many times during this uh, discussion of this subject, our danger always is to estimate things in terms of what we know, what we are familiar with in and of ourselves. That is the most fatal thing we can ever do. Because if you start regarding the church as she is now, as the norm, well then you've got to reduce these great New Testament statements to this level. And you evacuate them of their glory. But that's quite wrong. Now, what we have to remember is how the Christian church started. We've got to recapture this picture of the New Testament church. The New Testament church as we know her came into being as the result of that great outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And uh, you remember the circumstances. You remember the ecstasy and the excitement, the thrill and the power. Well, you saw an example of it in our reading this morning of what happened in the case of Cornelius and his household. Now, are you familiar with something like that? Have you ever seen anything like that happen? You see, that is what we call revival. Now, the New Testament church started like that with this tremendous outpouring of the Spirit. And therefore, it seems to me that it is more than likely that most members of the early church received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the way I find that is most helpful in approaching this matter is just to read the history of subsequent revivals in the long history of the church. And if you do that, this is what you find. You will find churches in an ordinary state and condition, such as, alas, you and I have known in this present century. Oh yes, the people are Christians. And they read their Bibles and they pray and they attend the services and God is pleased to grant a measure of blessing upon the preaching of the word and people are converted and added to the church and they're built up in the truth. All right. But there's no more than that. Many of them, perhaps most, cannot say that they rejoice in him with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. They can't say that honestly. They're aware of a deadness within them, having to force themselves and press themselves. They know nothing about abandon. They're unlike the early church, praising God with gladness and singleness of heart, eating their meat from house to house. This thrill that you feel in the book of the Acts of the Apostles and in the remainder of the New Testament. They know little about that. Now, that is how the churches have been. Then suddenly, something happens. It may happen to one man. It may happen to a group of people. The Holy Ghost comes down upon them. And they're utterly transformed and changed. And it may spread throughout a whole district or throughout a whole country or perhaps many countries at the same time. That is the great story of the history of revivals. And this is what you find at such a time. That large numbers of people get this experience. Some of them begin to doubt whether they'd even been saved before. 
They said, they say in the light of this, were we Christians before or not? But they were, they were Christians, but they hadn't received this baptism. But now they've received the baptism. And it happens to a large number at the present time. And if you were to describe the church at a time of revival, well, you would find that you'd be saying something very similar to what you read in the, in the New Testament itself. And you might think at such a time that every single member of the church has been baptized with the Holy Ghost. The point is that most of them have, but not all. Now, if that is true of the subsequent revivals of history, how much more so is it true of what happened at the beginning? Here you see God is starting off the church, and there is this overwhelming outpouring so that I don't find any real difficulty about this at all. It seems to me that the vast majority of the early Christians had received the baptism with the Holy Ghost. So when the apostles come to write their letters to them, they can assume that. They can act on that assumption and, uh, and supposition. And so the difficulty is resolved. But it is a very dangerous thing to argue from that and to say, very well then, isn't it equally true now? I say no, because I apply the tests. When a man is baptized with the Holy Ghost, when a number of people are baptized with the Holy Ghost, there's no difficulty about knowing it. You don't have to assume it or to persuade yourself that it's true. It manifests itself. Look at these people in the household of Cornelius. Here were the Jews who'd come with Peter. And remember, they were all nationalistic Jews, as Peter himself had been. It took a vision to persuade Peter that a Gentile could become a Christian. It was not an easy thing to do. And it was the same with his companions who hadn't seen the vision. And yet, to their amazement, they saw that these Gentiles had been baptized with the Holy Ghost exactly as they themselves had been at the beginning. And Peter can therefore turn to them and say, Can you refuse to give water to baptize these people? There was evidence. And my dear friends, unless there is evidence of this kind of life and of experience, it is not only dangerous, it is sinful to assume, because we are reducing these great New Testament statements to our level, that the people in the church today have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. No, no, we are not in a state of revival. Let's face that. That's the first thing we have to realize. There is no hope for the church until she realizes she is not in a state of revival. The Christian church today does not conform to the New Testament pattern, and that's the whole cause of the trouble. We start then with that first point. We cannot say that all the early Christians had been baptized with the Holy Ghost, but we can say that clearly the majority of them had been, and that the norm of the New Testament church was men and women manifesting in their daily lives the fact that they had been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Very well, let's go on to another point. Oftentimes one is asked this question, should we seek this baptism with the Holy Ghost? And of course, the answer must be obvious in the light of what I've just been saying. That's why I've put these things in this particular order. It is our business to desire to attain always to the norm. We have no right to do anything else. We don't judge the Christian life by what we are. We judge it by what the New Testament says. And we judge ourselves by what the New Testament says. And there I've put before you the picture of the norm, the standard, the pattern of the Christian church and of the individual Christian. I sometimes think that it will do us all great good if we face that text, 1 Peter 1, 8, every morning of our lives. There it is. Remember, these people had never seen the Lord Jesus Christ with their naked eyes. They were in exactly our position. They were not Palestinian Jews. They were people who lived in these various other countries. They'd never seen him. So Peter says, whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy that baffles description, beyond description. 
and full of glory. I think I reminded you a few months back that Philip Doddridge, in his note on that, says that this phrase, full of glory, means that you rejoice with him with a touch of the rejoicing that the saints in glory rejoice in him who are seeing him now face to face. Now, you, can't, you mustn't reduce that. That is how these people were. That is what you and I should be. Therefore, I argue that seeing that and recognizing that, I say to myself, I must become like that. I must not be content with anything less than that. If I do allow myself to be content with anything less than that, I am sinful. I am deliberately sinning. Surely this needs no demonstration. As you read about it here in the New Testament, you see it. You then read, if you like, the subsequent history of the church. See the church in times of revival. Or you take up the biography of individuals. And uh, you can do this. You can find it in the most ordinary people whom the world has never heard of. And then you can read about it in the lives of the great men whom the, everybody in the church has heard about doesn't make any difference, great and small, you will find that they have come to this position. They have lived this kind of life. They have rejoiced with a joy unspeakable and full of glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say the inevitable deduction to draw is this. I must be like that. I want this. So you must seek it. You mustn't try to argue it away or or to try to explain it away, the times have changed and so on. No, no, the teaching of the New Testament, as we've seen many times over, is this, that the promise is to you and to your children and to as many as are, as, as are afar off. There is nothing in the New Testament that says that all this was limited only to the early church. History proves that it wasn't limited. The history of revivals demonstrates that. What is there about 1965 which makes it exceptional? There's nothing. God is the same. The power of the Spirit is the same. Our needs are the same. Very well. Put all these things together. Should I seek it? Of course you should seek it. But then somebody argues, we're not told to seek it in the New Testament. Well, the answer to that again is a twofold one. We are. I dealt with Luke 11:13. It deals with this very thing. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And indeed, this argument I've just been deploying now, that seeing what was the condition of the New Testament, obviously there was no need for instruction for them to seek it. They'd already received it. So the emphasis in the New Testament is upon the control of the manifestations of the gift already received. In a time of revival, you don't have to exhort people to seek this blessing. They all do seek it automatically when they see what happens. But you have to deal with the problems that arise as the result of it. Very well. So there seems to me to be quite clear that everything urges us in the same direction that this is Something that we should all seek and seek with the whole of our being. But now that brings us to the next problem. Which uh, seems in many ways to be yet more difficult. People ask this question. How is this blessing received? How does this happen? And it is indeed a most important question. And what makes it of course so very important is what we've already seen about the danger of the counterfeits. If there were no danger of counterfeit, the problem would be so much easier. But we call the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit in order to show what he is by contrast with certain other spirits, evil spirits, headed up by the devil, who as the apostle reminds the Corinthians is able to transform himself even into an angel of light in order to deceive God's people. And I've put evidence before you to show how various agencies, psychological agencies and evil spirits can counterfeit so much of what is promised us by the Holy Spirit. So that it makes it doubly important 
that we should be extremely careful in our consideration as to how this great and glorious blessing is to be received. Now, let's look at it like this. Start with your New Testament again. Is it not clear that in New Testament times that the commonest way was for the Spirit to fall upon them? Now, I say this is the commonest. You had that instance that we read at the beginning this morning in the case of Peter preaching in the household of Cornelius. It's, 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 it's a typical. Well, you go back beyond that. Start. Let's start. Let's do the thing properly. Start with the apostles themselves and the company with them in the upper room. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Here it is in the household of Cornelius. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Then if you want a bit of negative evidence... In the same way, you get it negatively in the case of the people at Samaria to whom Philip the evangelist had preached. And then James and Peter and John come down from Jerusalem. Listen to the record. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Then in brackets, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, there, I say, is clearly the, the, the kind of norm, again, and pattern in the New Testament itself, that the Spirit fell upon them. And certainly, as you read uh, subsequent history, as I'll show you, it's the same, but let's keep ourselves for the moment uh, to the New Testament. But it is equally clear from the New Testament teaching that the apostles had the ability and the gift of being able to transmit this blessing to others by laying their hands upon them. This is again clear in the case of those Samaritans in Acts 8, for we read this. I read to you verse 16, as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And you remember how the Apostle Paul did exactly the same thing with those uh, disciples whom he found in Ephesus. In Acts 19.6, I read this. When Paul, no, let's go back. We read in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them but it was as the result of his laying of his hands upon them. In other words, it is quite clear that the apostles had this gift and this ability to transmit this baptism of the Spirit to people by the laying on of hands. There's no question about that. Then there is the interesting case of the conversion of the Apostle Paul himself. And uh, I put this before you simply in order that I may demonstrate that I'm not here to argue a case, but to put the evidence before you. It would be very convenient in many ways for me if I could say that only the apostles have this ability. But I am confronted by a fact. How the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, you remember, was struck blind, having seen the risen Lord, and here he is, he's converted, but now a man called Ananias is sent to the Apostle Paul. He didn't want to go. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he was. But that was through the hands of Ananias. 
who was not an apostle and who, as far as we can tell, was not even a leader in the early church. Nevertheless, that did happen. Now, how, what do you say with regard to all of this? Well, it's a very important point. And the only conclusion we can come to is this, that this is a gift that is given to some, clearly given to the apostles, clearly given to Ananias in that special instance of the apostle Paul. We must therefore not say that it's impossible now. We are not entitled to say that. We mustn't say it's impossible. We mustn't say that it cannot happen. But I think we are entitled to say this, that taking the New Testament evidence as it is, we do see it in the case of the apostles and in the case of this man sent on a special journey with a very special commission. And I would suggest that it's very dangerous to argue from that that it is possible, therefore, to all who have themselves been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I say that all the more for this reason, that looking at what we know can happen in terms of psychology and in the power of suggestion, we realize that there is a very great danger here. I would certainly not hesitate to say this, that no man should venture to lay his hands upon another unless he has received a definite and a special commission to do so. He mustn't do it automatically. He mustn't say everybody can do this. Unless he receives a very definite commission and has examined himself honestly in the light of the word, he should certainly not do so. Now, there's the New Testament, but come to the subsequent history, and this is important. What happens uh, in the case of the great revivals in the history of the church to which I've referred? What happened in the case of the many individuals of whom we can read? I've mentioned many of them to you already. I've mentioned people like Thomas Aquinas, and I've mentioned Pascal to you, and I've mentioned certain Puritans. We've mentioned Jonathan Edwards, we've mentioned John Wesley, George Whitfield, we've mentioned Charles Finney and D.L. Moody. I don't know whether I have mentioned, but I could have mentioned R.A. Torrey. These men have been used in this great and mighty manner. How will Harris, Daniel, Rowland, all the rest of these mighty men of God? How did it happen in these cases? Well, it's very interesting. I do not know of a single instance among such men where they received the blessing as the result of the laying on of the hands of somebody else. Not a single one. If you know of one, I should be glad to hear of it. What is interesting is that in the long history of the Christian church, in general revivals, or in the case of individuals, for a revival is nothing but a large number of people being baptized with the Holy Ghost at the same time. It can happen to one man, you don't call it revival then. If it happens to a number, you call it a revival of religion. Now, in all these cases, what has happened has been that the Holy Ghost has fallen upon them, has come upon them. There's a great variation in the history. It's most interesting to notice this. Sometimes this has happened to people without their expecting it at all, without their even seeking it. And that's very wonderful to me, for it demonstrates the lordship of the Spirit. You will find that it happened to some people without their knowing what had happened. Take a man like Finney. He was converted one day, the next day this happened to him. He didn't know about it. He just found it happening. He hadn't prayed, he hadn't sought. It happened to him. That's the true of many others. But then you'll find others who had been seeking this for months and sometimes for years and had almost given up in despair when suddenly God graciously caused the Spirit to fall upon them. There's almost endless variation and it's important we should realize that. And as, it, as that is true in the case of individuals, it is true also in the case of the larger groupings of the Christian church. You will find sometimes that people in the church, having become dissatisfied, having examined themselves, having realized the lack and the need, or having seen the problem of the church and the problem of the unconverted masses going to hell outside the church, they have met together and they have prayed and prayed and agonized and have done so for a considerable time. 
God then answers. But there have been other times when the church has not been aware of all this. Indeed, and this was more or less the position 200 years ago in the evangelical awakening, both in this country and in America. And the church as a whole had been doing nothing. But God suddenly deals with an individual, one here, one there, unknown to one another. And through dealing with one man, he has been able to rouse the church and to shower the blessing in a more general manner upon them. But the point I am making is this. That this long history of the Christian church, both in individuals and in larger groupings, it has been the case that this has happened not as the result of the laying on of hands, but the Spirit coming. There's an individual in his room, sometimes reading his Bible. Spirit comes. Or another one on his knees, praying to God. Sometimes praying for this particular blessing. Sometimes praying for something else, more general. Suddenly the Spirit falls upon him. And he's aware of this tremendous thing taking place in him and upon him. And the same with churches. Meeting. There's a wonderful description of this. Those of you who are interested will find it in the biography of Andrew Murray of South Africa. How he was presiding at a prayer meeting when suddenly this happened. And he even heard a noise, a kind of rumbling, something analogous to that which happened on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem as described in Acts 2. And there, suddenly, the Spirit came and a revival uh, broke out. Now, that has been the testimony and the history of the church throughout the centuries, until this present century. I'm just putting facts of history before you. This whole idea of giving the gift by laying on of hands has been restored by the Pentecostal movement in this present century. But until then, you don't find it. You find, rather, what seems to have been the norm in the New Testament itself, namely that the Spirit has fallen upon people in the various ways that I have tried to describe to you. Very well, there is something then which we must bear in mind. That seems to have been the way and the method of the Spirit throughout the centuries. I'm not saying that a man cannot have the gift of giving the gift to others. I'm not excluding it, but I'm saying let's be careful. If he has acted like this throughout the centuries, why should it suddenly become common that people can lay hands on others? And especially when you bear in mind the psychological danger and the power of suggestion and hysteria and various other things like that. There, it seems to me, is the evidence. But now we've got to come to a particular term. And this is what I want to close with this morning. What is the meaning of this word, receive? You'll find, and we have found in dealing with this subject, that the word receive is the word that is constantly used. Take the Apostle Paul, for instance, in Romans 8.14. For we have not, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Or the question put by Paul to those people at Ephesus. How did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Receive. Now there's a great deal of confusion, it seems to me, with regard to this particular word. I'm not going to enter into it in detail. I did so on one, occa on one occasion uh, in dealing with that passage in Romans 8 verses 14, 15, and 16, and went into the grammar of it all in a very thorough way. Let me try and summarize the position by putting it like this. The danger, it seems to me, with regard to this word receive, is to put too much emphasis upon our activity in receiving, as if it entirely depends upon us. So you will find that people teach that you can receive this blessing whenever you like. There it is for you. The trouble is, you haven't received it. You haven't taken it. But you can have it whenever you like, they say. Now that is because they put the emphasis upon our activity in receiving. Or another way in which it is put is this. There's a phrase which is used, and here it is. 
Take it by faith. Take it by faith. The promise is to you and to your children and to as many as are afar off. Very well. Take it. Take it by faith. Don't worry about your feelings, they say. Don't worry whether you feel anything or not. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Very well. Take it. And thank God for it. You can take it by faith whenever you like, just as you are. It is by faith. And therefore, you can take it. That is how this word receive is interpreted. And they produce certain scriptures uh, to try to support their contention. And here are the ones that are reduced most commonly. Galatians 3, 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3, 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And again, the 14th verse in that same chapter, that the blessing of Abram might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And they link that up with the great statement of our Lord as recorded in John 7, 39, where John says, This spake he of the Spirit, that they which believe on him should receive. Now, this is to me a most important matter. Because I'm convinced it's a misinterpretation of the meaning of the word receive. It isn't active, it's passive. I was able to demonstrate that from the grammar of Romans 8, 14. It must be taken in a passive sense, not in an active sense. In other words, look at these descriptions which you have in the New Testament of people being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Take the apostles on the morning of the day of Pentecost. There they are, they're praying in the upper room. And there, while they were praying, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, didn't they? Yes, but do you put your emphasis upon their taking? Of course you don't. They received in this way that it was sent upon them. They were passive. The activity is in the Holy Ghost. The Lord sent down the Holy Ghost upon them. And that is what is meant by receiving. And it's the same with all the others. You, don't, you mustn't say that they took it by faith. They didn't. It happened to them. And this is the whole point that the New Testament makes, and as the subsequent history of the church supports, that this is something that happens to people. They don't decide to take the baptism of the Spirit by faith. No, no, you can't do that, actually. I know many people who have tried to do that and tried to do it many times. They've heard this teaching, so they've taken it by faith. They say, I must have had it, I do believe, I thank God for it. But they don't feel any different, and they are no different. They don't show the evidence of baptism with the Spirit. And nobody else can see that they've been baptized with the Spirit. The fact is, they haven't been baptized with the Spirit. So it's very important that we shouldn't misunderstand this. Let me use an illustration, which may help. I've used it before, in connection with this word receive. Look at it like this. Let's imagine that I send, sent you last week a parcel. I decided to send you a gift, so I sent you this parcel last week. And I've been expecting to hear from you that uh, the parcel had arrived safely and so on, but I haven't heard from you. So I write you a letter and I say, did you receive a parcel from me last week? Now what, am I, what do I mean by that word receive? Am I saying, did you go to the door when the doorbell rang and by a great effort of the will took that parcel out of the hands? Of course you don't. No, no. What I'm really asking is this. Did a postman deliver my parcel to you last week? You were passive. I'm the sender and the postman is my agent. You just receive it. You mustn't put the activity into your receiving. Of course not. But that's the word that we use, receive. It's, it's passive. The activity is entirely on the part of the giver. And here it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, of course, this becomes yet more serious. When uh, this uh, teaching about the activity of the receiver, or the taking by faith, is even pressed in a mechanical manner. 
I think I've described it to you before. And I know of nothing that is more unlike the New Testament than this. When people are taught, you can have this whenever you like. Do you want this? Very well, stay for an after meeting. Then in the after meeting, you are put to sit in chairs, you relax, and you are told now you can breathe in the Spirit, breathe in deeply, breathe in rhythmically, breathe in. And as you're breathing in, you are breathing in the baptism of the Spirit into yourself. Now, one simply has to ask a question. Is there anything in any sense whatsoever suggestive of that in the New Testament? Is there anything suggestive of that in the subsequent history of the church in revival? And the answer is nothing whatsoever. That is pure psychology. I don't hesitate to say that. And there is nothing more dangerous you and I, my friends, can do nothing about receiving this gift. Nothing at all. It is the prerogative of the Lord. And it is in his sovereign will. You can keep all the conditions. And many I know have tried to do this. And you can breathe deeply and you can take it by faith. You can do everything that you're told to do. And you'll get nothing. What I mean by saying you'll get nothing is this. I mustn't even say that even in spite of your wrong teaching, the, the Lord may in his goodness give you the blessing, but that doesn't mean the teaching is right. No, no, it's in spite of it. What I mean is that men and women have done all this and have received nothing. Obviously you can't. It's a gift. It is the gift of the ascended Lord. And he gives it when he chooses and to whom he chooses. And you and I must not emphasize our activity in receiving. Go back to your New Testament and see how it always happened. Read, I say, the subsequent history of the church and see how it has continued to happen. When this happens, it's unmistakable, and a man knows that it's happened. That's why Paul was able to put the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And in Galatians 3, as I've already expounded to you, so I needn't repeat it, the apostle is simply saying the same thing. He's contrasting law and faith. He says everything in the Christian life comes to us as the result of faith. It's through faith you have everything, even the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the faith relationship that makes all these things possible, not law. That's all the apostle is concerned to say. He is not teaching that you can take it by faith whenever you like. All he is saying is this. It is always in the realm of faith and never in the realm of law. Well, very well then. We must leave it at that for this morning. There are just... A few problems and questions and difficulties left that we have to deal with. But my dear friends, God forbid that anybody should go from this service this morning with the details or the particulars in his or her mind. The great question I'd like to leave with you is this. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Have you received him up to date? Have you been baptized? with the Holy Ghost? That's the question. We all of us either have or have not. And we know exactly which it is. Has the love of God been shed abroad in your heart? Do you know what it is to cry, Abba, Father? Does the Spirit bear witness with your spirit? that you are a child of God. I'm not talking about deducing evidence. The Spirit himself directly, immediately, letting you know that you are a child of God. Those are some of the evidences, and there are others. Do you rejoice in him with a joy unspeakable and full of glory? He who died for you, whose body was broken, whose blood was shed, do you rejoice in him with a joy unspeakable and full of glory? Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. 
You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.